folks, and welcome or welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima, I'm again, and this podcast was brought to you, among others, by Emil Gorgis, a Tokyo real estate agent who specializes in serving international or mixed nationality families looking for the perfect family home. So Emil's an Australian. He's been living here in Japan for the past two decades, eight years of which he's been actively buying, selling, and managing real estate properties in the city, on behalf of his own family and a great many happy clients. And he also acts as a mortgage broker on behalf of his clients. So his company has a dedicated loan officer in many of the Japanese mega banks. And if you're a regular listener, you probably already know him from our JREP, the Japan Real Estate Experts panel sessions. So you're probably already aware that the man is an absolute fountain of wisdom on all things related to real estate in Japan and in particular to family homes, the greater Tokyo metropolitan area and mortgages. And most importantly, he's incredibly generous with his time and advice, which he's more than happy to provide at no cost or commitment to anyone asking. So if you've been thinking about buying your home in Tokyo, but you've been sitting on the fence for a while, or if you just want to have a chat in English with a real expert, drop him a line on emil.gorgis, that's E-M-I-L dot G O R G double E S Emil dot Gorgies at Tokyo Realty dot JP. Hit him up today and start exploring your options. All right, so for today's episode, which you guessed it, is yet another J Rep session, we're talking money, interest rates, which have gone up for the first time in a very long time here in Japan, how foreign investors can and should be dealing with foreign currency exchange, rates fluctuating, and when and how to be remitting funds between Japan and other countries. Very relevant topic at the moment with the USD uh, buying more yens than it has for more than two decades. We then segue into a chat about Japan's equity and real estate markets and how to be strategic when investing in them. The availability of investment loans, whether for business investment or property investment, what are the advantages and disadvantages buying cash versus using these loans. And if you are buying in cash, what is the bare minimum required budget to get started with Japanese real estate and what it will and won't buy you. Then we finish off talking about saving and investing for retirement, which is an excellent way to also hint at an upcoming guest that we're going to have joined the panel. So really good chat today, especially for you uh, money heads out there. Enjoy the conversation and I'll see you again on the other side. All right. Japan Real Estate Experts panel back in session minus Matt. Um, quick round of introductions, folks. Have we ever had a full like five of us in the, in the same room at the same time? No, nope. like, we did. No, no, we did oh, once. We no. So we're like we're like you know Superman, Clark Kent, and Superman are never in the same room at the same time. <laughs> Which one is the su- is the superhero? I'm, I'm trying to figure out how that one works <laughs> <laughs> in this group. Um. So yeah, you mean Matt is actually a meal? Ah, uh, well, they've got the well. You, you, you oh no, they were on together. So Matt is actually Blanca. Yeah. Yes, oh. yes, me and no, but me and Matt, we were on uh, at the same time. No, uh, it's shapeshifters, shapeshifters. Oh. Yes, well, I'm not, a, I'm not a shapeshifter. I am Tracy. I am your resident minpaku or short term rental expert. I run a company called Tokyo Family Stays, and I also have a consulting business that I help other minpaku hosts or short term rental hosts globally to maximize their investments and their uh, and their profits from short term rentals. Okay, so me next. Uh, I'm Blanca Kobayashi. I am the marketing director and co-owner of Agriform. We are a bilingual reform company. We serve Tokyo, Chiba, Saitama, and we can help you to renovate your house, your office, create your store, build your showroom, anything and everything that has anything to do with your house renovations. So you can hit us up for that. And I am Emil Gorgis. I'm a real estate agent here in Tokyo. I help um, you know, foreigners and mixed families buy a personal home in Tokyo. So a lot of my customers are young families just starting up, maybe pregnant, just got married, expecting a child, maybe one or two young children, um, looking to buy a house. And that's what I do. Um, uh, using uh, Japanese financing, 0.5%, 0.7% interest rates, uh, what we have uh, right now. Um, 100% financing, so we organize all the financing and 
basically do the bro the brokering function for you as well. Um, and we can do everything in English. So if you have any questions, um, send me an email. I'm happy to have a phone call. Usually that takes about an hour to really discuss your situation and your options um, and explain the, the process to you. So if you're curious, uh, please reach out. Um, my email is in the uh, description. And over to you, Ziv. Yeah, and I'm Ziv Nakajima again, co-founder and partner in Nippon Tradings International, or NTI for short, and we help with them. Um, everything else so investment properties holiday homes land for development anywhere around japan and you can purchase whether you are in japan or remotely whether you speak japanese or do not we bridge that gap for you all right so what are we uh, going to talk about today i mean emil you mentioned them um, in your intro financing and we also had a couple of email exchanges this week about interest rates going up yes we did we did um Hmm. Interest rates going up. Uh, uh, someone posted also in the Facebook group uh, that the Japan Real Estate Facebook group. They said so. Uh, Prestia website, like all, all bank websites have it, but Prestia website as well. Um, they posted some screenshots of uh, several months ago the uh, ten-year fixed um, interest uh, loan was, I think, what one point. Do you recall what they said? Was one point three percent, and now uh, the ten-year fixed is uh 10.5 that's the first time it's happened in a long time in japan 1.6 percent all the numbers but it's gone up about 0.3 percent that's a lot um that's actually pretty well, huge. we're talking with well no no so, so variable rate hasn't changed we're talking the 10-year fixed term rate Okay, um, it's changed, and they are forecasting. So that basically means, you know, you look over the, the past few months, and it, it just suggests that if the long term rate changes, they they are suspecting that the interest rates will go up in the coming years. That's that's how it works. So that's what's happened. Uh, we haven't noticed variable rates go uh, like variable rates are still the same: zero point four five percent and zero point six five percent. Um, but what you can see, so how banks work in general is whether you choose fixed or variable, the net profit for the bank should be about the same. That's why banks aren't so pushy about which option you choose. Do you choose a variable or the interest or a 10-year, three-year fixed, five-year fixed, 15-year fixed, or the full 35-year term fixed? They don't really care which one you choose. And you can even mix and match because at the end, they expect that the net their net profit will be about the same and how so how they decided is the economists in-house economists will do their analysis of what they think future long-term interest rates short-term or long-term interest rates are going to behave and they price accordingly so in australia we saw for example the um there were times um where the variable rate was quite high but the three-year fixed interest rate was lower than the current variable. That means that in three years time, the average, they, the, the bank's economists think that the interest rates are gonna decrease over the next three years, right? If you see the opposite happen where the short term, where, where the fixed interest rates are higher than the current variable rate, it means that they expect interest rates will increase in the coming years. And that's, how, that's why it's priced according to that. So what the person posted and makes sense considering the current situation is the variable rates are still the same, but the suspicion is that uh, in the coming years, interest rates will increase slightly. That's why the 10 year rate went from, you know, let me pull it up. I think it's like one point something, like 1.1% 1, 1 .1 is what they were saying the 10 year fixed term rate was uh, a few months ago. Now it's about 1.3%. So it's gone up. So they think in the next decade, the average interest rate will be up about 0.2%. That hasn't happened in Japan for a long time, right? Uh, no. So for the past about 15 years, the interest rate has been about the same, which has been like ridiculously low. So even if you've been on a variable interest rate over the past 15 years, it's been about the 0.5 to 0.7% for the, the whole time. So remembering that's for people who are like looking for finance here now but 
the you know the other side of that is that the yen is at a like you know the yen is completely tanked so you know bringing foreign money in now is like you know you're 30 percent up right so you 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 your buying power is 30 percent more um so you know i don't know how long that's going to last um you know who's to say so yeah so right now like my i do get some inquiries through foreign um in either some foreign investors looking to buy a home here so i not i only have people i think ziv you tend to have most of your clients are foreign investors with a bit of cash that want to buy properties but i have some uh people that then i want to say foreign investors they, they live overseas but they have some connection to japan maybe they lived in japan before a spouse is japanese and so they do come back and forth to japan and they think okay now's a good time to buy a house here because they've got their foreign income their foreign funds and the japanese yen right now is what, 136 like one us dollar yeah. is 136 yen which yeah. is like a 20-year a um low um yeah. for the japanese yen so the so even in the 12 past 12 months it's gone down about 20 percent so people that were considering buying now they get a 20 percent discount on a japanese property yeah. they so now they're thinking look okay maybe i can now is a good time to buy because they have foreign sourced income or even uh like a lot of foreigners that have um cash overseas think okay now is a good time to bring money over and make the purchase yeah. however um so, so that's one one type and they're looking you know, to buy either a personal place or a place for them to sort of even if it's a short term maybe in, an investment right now they're going it's a place where they're going to come back and live um in the future mm -hmm. because there is a connection to japan however uh, there is also now because the stock market is quite low if those people have for um their money in stocks even though the exchange rate is is quite good to bring money in the stock market is low so it's not, not a good time to sell your stock so i did there are people in both both camps if they have cash they're happy to bring it into japan if they have stock they're not happy to liquidate it <laughs> to bring it into japan uh, and that, that's the uh that, that's a bit uh, and so that's a very personal situation and it's not necessarily um people living overseas even people in japan um have the you know a lot of people you know that work at the large multinational organizations have uh, stock packages that that come in um or uh, uh, employee stock purchase plans so they've accrued stock in like you know a u.s trading account mm. not a good time to sell especially in the tech tech industry yeah. nor, nor is it a good time to sell your bitcoin no i know Keep your crypto in your wallet. Keep your crypto in your wallet, absolutely. But like, I, 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 I've, That's I've, it. You, I've always your crypto should my, always be in your wallet, by the oh, way. Oh, yeah, it should always be in your wallet. But um, <laughs> I've never, you know, actually tried to dabble in the Japanese stock market at all. I know it's sort of slightly off, like, from real estate, but, um, but all my... Uh, you know, are a lot of people getting in their packages? You know, they're seeing that as a better investment on their on their money for uh, investing in the Japanese stock market compared to property. Because I know what it is for Australia, but what is it for? What, what's it like in Japan? In your opinion, I this is a this is a question for me rather than for the podcast. Um, what's the question sorry the question is is like does uh, how are stocks performing in japan overall like not, not necessarily right now but you know we know that real estate has very little capital gain opportunities um compared to other countries but what's the you know the, the japanese stock market do people experience usually a fairly good capital gain It depends on the stocks you're choosing. I mean, you can invest in stock. No, but I mean, there's basically um, potential growth stocks. There's dividend yielding stocks, which just give you like a paycheck every month. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm not a big expert on equity markets, but um, no, I, it's kind of like asking what kind of real estate is better. Like, well, should I buy in central Tokyo or suburban Fukuoka? I mean, yeah, there's, there's well, pros and cons to all of them, I guess. But I wouldn't say that necessarily if you know where to invest, even in real estate here in Japan. And like if you, for example, if you think um, 
Otakanomori, those of you that are a little bit familiar with the Nagariyama part, Tokyo Nagariyama, uh, 20 years ago, there was nothing there. And there was just, you know, it was complete inaka. And right now, Nagariyama is one of the fastest, if not the fastest growing area. And the real estate over there went up so much that those that bought properties or bought land there years ago are now banking on that. My friend has a house there. Behind the house were two empty plots that uh, they were trying to buy. Then they stopped the negotiation before Corona because there was kind of no, uh, they, there was a little bit insecurity about what's going to happen. And uh, when they came back to the table, uh, the price had doubled. That was two years ago. So it's not always that you would not make money on real estate or properties in Japan, but I think it's a very long term game and you really need to kind of go into probably do your research and invest in, in areas that you think will be developing and then the development will go there. We've made a pretty good investment over here over the past five years and the value went up. We bought really well, but then also if we would sell even just the house that we built now last year, that small piece of land would basically cover 90% or 80%, 85% of what we bought the entire property for. Yeah, it's great when it happens, but I think it's similar to gambling on a startup, right? Like you could hit, you, you know, could hit the location yeah. that might yeah. suddenly, so, you could be right about but it, but like then... Yeah. <laughs> I, I think the... So, yeah, so like, let's take the speculation aspect out of it, right? Um, same with, so Tracy, your question about stocks, right? And I, I tend to be a bit conservative with my discussion on, you know, and my analysis on, okay, like how to pick and choose and what do you think the market will do and how it will behave. Um, so in terms of the stock market, okay, yeah, definitely you can pick and choose individual stocks that may do well and, and whatnot. But let's take that away and just look at index one. Like, what's the market doing overall? Because if you think mm. I don't, I don't know what to choose. Um, then how's the Japanese stock market performing? When you look at the the index, right? How's the index performing across the board? And is now a good time to put money in? So tradition, like historically, Japan has been quite the stable market. Okay, again, not not financial advice. <laughs> um, but it's been quite stable, right? When when um, there's chaos all around the world then people put their money into japan like lehman shock time for example uh people put their money into J um, in japan because it's quite stable and then when other places then when things are performing well people take their money out and put it in other countries right now we're seeing the us dollar go up because in inflation and interest rates are going up it's more attractive to invest your money in the us than it is in japan because the interest rates are going up. So that's why you're seeing the change. It's the supply and demand. Okay, there's more demand for US dollars, so people are buying that, hence the price goes up. Um, the, but going back to your question about stocks, right? so if you want to buy something, you know, just invest in the stock market and you have US dollar, now's a good time to buy because the companies are not performing badly, right? Uh, if you, mm. and I'm not gonna say which, company in particular but just invest in the mm -hmm. japanese stock market then yes now is a good time because things are quite things seem to be low and the exchange rate is low so mm -hmm. if you want to buy get into japanese stocks um with us dollar then now because of the exchange rate it it makes sense in that regard okay but whereas for which stock to pick and choose that's that becomes more more complex and that's quite based on your particular portfolio um, and similarly with real estate, right? People that are looking stocks and real estate, um, it's it's they, they it's different. People aren't looking at like you. You may look at either one or the other. I find if you live in Japan, the good values to get the, like I think one of the best deals you can do is buy your own place first, because you can buy one with actually very little opportunity cost. Yes, um, if, you have mm -hmm. yeah. if you have a hundred, yeah, if you have a hundred thousand dollars, like ten million yen. You can put into the stock market or you can buy an overseas asset. Um, and But people think, oh, or I can buy a house. 
But actually, no, in Japan, if you live here and you want to buy your own place, you can buy your own place without having having any cash, yeah? To put, mm, yeah. Use that 10 million for anything. The, ba- the bank will um, pay everything. So we just had some uh, a client do, um, you know, he's a uh, permanent resident and he's looking at a property. It's about 80, was it 87 million yen? Um, and uh, we're looking at, so we want to borrow the 87 million from the bank and another um, four and a half million yen of closing costs. So about 91 or 92 million yen we want to borrow from the bank. And it's going to cost him uh, like, uh, I think, 160,000 yen out of pocket. So it's all like $1,600 out of pocket to make the purchase. And the bank will pay everything else. Yeah. So it's um, a bit different saying, oh, I've got 10 million yen or $100,000. Should I buy stocks or real estate investment or buy my own property? I think you can buy your own property without impacting the decision. There's no real opportunity cost yeah. um, to do that. So I think it's when we talk, and also when we talk about buying your personal home, I feel that's different to investing, right? This is where you're going to live. You're technically the tenant of it. This is where you're going to raise your family. So it's not just about, you know, oh, I'm going to, because I don't want to live in a place that's developing and have to wait 20 years for it to be worth something for me to flip. Um, right. So, I want to live in some place I really like right now. And overall, the Tokyo stock, the Tokyo real estate market has done quite well over the past decade. Um, so we have a, a client in uh, Nozawa, Emil, right Emil, near um, Sanjaya. Emil, you're referring to okay. people who are um, in a position to purchase their family home, and I completely agree with you. But assuming mm-hmm. that either you're not eligible for a loan in Japan or alternatively you've already purchased your family home in Japan and now you're looking at what to do with the rest of your money, which I think is more where um, Tracy's question was coming for. So obviously if you can get a virtually interest-free loan or close to it in Japan and buy your own family home, absolutely. But then that's no money down. What do you do after that? You've got cash, you want to invest it in. What are the pros and cons? Mm. Yeah. So quickly on that, the pros and cons is I, you know, like uh, I think one that I'll speak to is li- liquidity. So if you have ten million yen, you can buy you can or five million yen, whatever amount you have, you can buy that much in the stock market, and you know it's going to be sort of the, the average across it. Whereas with real estate, it you you're not going to be able to put the full amount in. Right? Oh, like there's going to be some off. Maybe you find a great place that's 8 million yen, it's 4 million yen, it's 6 million yen, whatever, you know, 100, uh, like 15 million yen, whatever. It's not as flexible as I think stocks. And also if you want to, if you want to get the cash out with stocks, you can sell a million yen worth of stock should you need it for something else. You can't sell 1 million yen of your real estate property. There's a bit of an advantage to that, though. Not being liquid means you can't also panic sell, right? You can't, yeah. you know, if you see the value of real estate trending down and you're thinking, oh, oh my God, I should liquidate it. You're going to have at least two months to think about it before you're going to be able to pull the trigger, right? Yeah. Well, that, that's personal discipline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, that's my take on sort of, you know, in terms of the investment. Um, it's a completely different investment uh, tool. Okay. Um, so if you only, like, you know, if you only had a million yen, I, I personally don't think it's a great idea to put it in real estate because if that's all the cash you have, you may need it. Yeah. What if you get married or some, you know, or you, you need it for emergency funds, whatnot. Um, if you decide to put it in a stock market, it's easy to access. But I think real estate becomes a bit more like the real estate is less liquid. It's long term. It's long term. Plus, you can diversify with smaller. I actually had this conversation with a customer um, earlier this week is that, yes, we do also service people who come up to us and say, yeah, we've got, you know, I've got 20 or 30,000 bucks, two or three million yen. That's my entire savings. And I want to get my feet wet with real estate. So yes, we, we can help you with that. And there are properties available that will actually generate income. But 
there's zero diversification and you've really got very few options to choose from. So you're not going to get the best bang for your buck if you've got a relatively lower amount to invest in real estate. And Japan is better than other countries for that. There's still something available, but we feel more comfortable helping people when we can you know, suggest a few options to them and point out the benefits, the advantages, the disadvantages, and maybe potentially diversify into two assets instead of one. Um, if you've got twenty or thirty thousand dollars, even if you know you don't need that money in a hurry and you can park it somewhere, it's maybe better to invest in something that you can at least slightly diversify within, right? Yeah. We interrupt this broadcast. I always wanted to say this. We interrupt this broadcast to tell you about Tokyo Family Stays. They're a short-term rentals company in Tokyo, and they offer a home away from home experience, which is just perfect for remote working, quarantining, or if you just need summer quiet to hide away from the world. So they offer a variety of options for families, for corporate relocations, or simply if you're transitioning between homes in Tokyo. Now, the properties are super comfortable, tastefully furnished, fully equipped with all amenities, and they accommodate up to 10 people. So really, the only thing you'll need to bring with you is your toothbrush and maybe a change of clothes. They've got fast, unlimited wireless internet, dedicated workspaces, and fully equipped kitchens, and they're just a delight to stay in, a fantastic alternative to Japanese business hotels, which if you've ever stayed in one, you probably know they're tiny, they're noisy, fine for a night or two if you're on your own, but long term or with a family, you'll probably feel you're in a jail cell very quickly. So if you want to give yourself a sense of space and freedom by renting a real home with comfortable Western beds, including all the necessities like baby bedding, children's toys, high chairs, you definitely want to reach out to Tokyo Family Stays. They've been at it for over a decade. They're a fully licensed minpaku or short-term stay operator. And as a special bonus for our viewers and listeners, they're also throwing in a breakfast basket upon arrival for anyone who books and mentions the Japan Real Estate Podcast or NTI. And not only for guests, if you're a property owner, you've got an investment property that you want to tweak for higher profits or a holiday home that you want rented out when not in use via short-term stays, drop them a line today, see how they can help you maximize your property's income. And again, as a special bonus to our viewers and listeners, they're also offering a free audit of your existing short-term stay listings without any obligation whatsoever. So feel free to reach out to them at tokyofamilystays.com. Well worth your visit. And again, if you're in the market for a family home in or around the Tokyo metropolitan area, Emil's your man. Don't be shy to reach out to him as well at emil.gorgies, G-O-R-G-E-E-S at tokyorealty.jp. Yeah, never, never have all of your eggs in one basket in any any investment. In any, yeah, in yeah. anything. Mm. That's why it's like it, it was just interesting because, like, you know, I have a mix of investments in Australia and in here, and it was just I'd never really thought about the Japanese stock market, which is where that question came from. So mm. I was just like, ah, oh, maybe this is something I need to add to my mix. So, um, but no, I would never put like a hundred percent of any savings into any one thing. Um, uh, so that's always, that's what my dad taught me. Yeah. Smart my man. <laughs> we need, we need, I think Ben Tanaka from retired Japan, um, to, to address this particular topic a little bit more, but in terms of the stock market, so right now, um, you know, one thing I, I, I bought his book. So anyone listening, if you're interested, like, I guess we do real estate, but if you are interested in. Um, retirement and investment in, in more stock market. Um, Retire Japan. Uh, I don't know if that's the .com, the website, or the, there's definitely a Facebook group and the, the, uh, Is the that forum. Is like that st estate planning as well? I, that sounds like a, something I need to do. Mm, no, no. So it, he's, he's an individual and he just basically blogs about um, investment options for people living in Japan um, and like or retirement options. And But a lot of it is based on... Um, uh, pension and stock stock investing it's been on our podcast a couple but of times it, i think you'd be happy to join the panel once or twice yeah, yeah definitely yes yes uh so uh he has been on, on your podcast and so he's uh what he writes about is nisa nisa and uh, uh ideco independent um uh, what's it called uh, individual uh, uh what's it the, the pension when you contribute to your own pension the like contribution pension scheme uh in japan so I think if you do, if you are interested in buying uh, stocks in Japan, um, because it's probably not not a great time now because of low yen to 
purchase uh, overseas. Like you don't want to send money overseas. It's a bit more painful if you're sourced income source in Japan and you are interested in buying them in Japan. Uh, I do recommend you consider a NISA account, N-I-S-A, and Ben Tanaka's site, uh, Retire Japan, has like a 2,000 yen e-book, $20 e-book, that tells you all about NISA um, and how it works. And basically, it's a tax um, it's a tax beneficial account for buying uh, stocks in Japan, which you get a five-year waiver from any capital gain. It's similar for Australian listeners. It's similar to the SMSF, the self-managed super fund that you can uh, set up in Australia, or I think in the in the states it's called the four hundred one k. Four hundred one k. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So Japan yeah. has finally joined the party and set up those for individuals in Japan as well. That's interesting because I, I mean, I've you know I've lived in Japan what twenty two years and I've been putting into Nenkin for all of that time, but. I do not expect that that's going to support me at all in my dotage. So I have my own, you know, I have another system. I have my Australian system. Then, of course, I've got, like, real estate. So I was really trying to diversify to make sure that, yeah. get, or not all eggs are in one basket. So, yeah. I mean, I understand real estate more than anything else. Um, but... Um, and Interestingly enough, well, Japan yeah. doesn't actually, I mean, even though it's got those structures here in Japan now, they don't recognize those structures overseas as potential owners of property. So if you if you have a self-managed super fund or whatever you call it in the States or elsewhere, if you got one of those overseas, because they're not an individual and they're also not an incorporated entity, then they cannot be property owners in Japan. Japan doesn't recognize that. So the only way around that, if you want the tax benefits in your um, home country, is to set up a company, have the fund own the company, and then the company can own property. So that's mm -hmm. doable, but then oh, you need to factor that against the, uh, the upkeep costs and the corporate tax that you'll be paying for having that company. Wow. Okay. <laughs> one, mm. one, I want to just quickly touch on one fine, final point about one of the I think benefits that real estate has over regular um, stock uh, investment. And again, I don't know all the stock tools, but it's quite easy to get um, uh, funding, like a mortgage, um, get loans for real estate investment. Yeah. And so insurance. If you have only, don't forget insurance. No, insurance, yes, definitely. So, um, yeah, if you have only, like, you know, say 5 million yen, 10 million yen to invest, and you, you are living in Japan you can get also potentially an investment loan. So the conditions aren't as good as a personal home loan. Interest rates, generally they want at least a 20% deposit and interest rates are closer to two, maybe two and a half percent. But your 10 million yen can then borrow you 50 million yen. So if you have 10 million yen you want to put in the stock market, you can put it in the stock market. Or if you just want to buy cash in real estate, you can just put get a 10 million yen asset. Or if you use leverage, um, with a bank loan, you can get a that 10 million yen can buy you a 50 million yen asset, um, which means the rental yields are, are even better. And I think if you have a, you know, traditionally in Japan and with a, a stable, um, a, uh, like if you get a good property in a good location, uh, then I think the risk, if you be smart about your purchase decision, the risk is minimal. Um, but yeah, I think that's one of the this benefits. Week who, uh, by the way, I spoke to someone this week who, or last week, who said that. Um, if you're earning, stably earning, I mean, uh, over a period of four or five years, if you've got a Japanese stable income of 15 million yen a year or more, um, you may be eligible for 100% investment bonds, you know, which I've never run across yet. Um, I haven't looked into them either, but I do know that, you know, the banks we deal with, they like applicants. If you earn over like 20 million yen, so that 200,000 a year, um, they treat you, you know, like high income earners get treated more beneficially. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I can definitely believe that uh, some banks, yeah, if you are over 15 or 20 million yen, then they will treat you a bit nicer and are willing to, to extend, you know, more, more financing to you. Mm. We should then, I wonder, do we know somebody who specializes in investment loans in Japan? Because that would we, we keep getting asked that and we don't really have that many answers. Yeah, I keep getting asked that too and I don't have any answers. So, 
Yeah. And you, you, well, you, Emil is the specialist in residential, so I keep asking him, and he says, "No, not my, not my jam." So. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, no, because oh no, so the, the one that's not my jam is business loans. People are like, oh, I've got a, I've got a company. Can can I establish a company out of the blue and then get a million dollars of finance for that company that's uh, that's you know one week old? Um, oh, no, what about companies that are ten years old, fifteen years old? So. You can get a loan if you, um, even Person for even for a newly established company here, you can get the loan, but they require a very well written business plan usually, with a market analytics. You know, you have to do your market research, comparing where does your company stand in the market, uh, who is your target. Uh, group, why does your target group will choose you over the other companies? You have to compare uh, if there is a similar company that your than yours in the area of your target. So competition why, analysis, okay. You know everything. the uh, The business plan that they are requiring for a business uh, for a business loan is quite like it's 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 big. It's that's it's. It has a lot of parts. They do a lot of banks right now, though. They offer a free consulting services, with but all in Japanese. There's no English support uh, with that, as far as I know. But they do offer um, consulting, like a, like a business loan, business plan consultant that will go with you through uh, what you need, what you don't need, where you should get that. And then you can send him your business plan and then he will look at it and he will tell you, okay, well, this one you have to work more on and stuff and that. So it's a quite a lengthy process. But yeah, eventually they will, of course, they, know, they will check your, they want to see your, um, uh, they want to see like your, Uriaga, whatever you, your uh, tax. Right. That's for a business loan. Yeah. How about a property so, investment so, loan? Does a property... So, Usually they ask for the past three years. If you are a new company, then they want to see like kind of a looking ahead. So what is your plan? What is your target? How are you planning to hit the targets and things like that? So it's complicated, but it's doable. Yeah, it's, it's complicated. And it's, the hard thing is, is like you can either spend your time chasing the money or you can spend your time chasing sales and actually creating your uh, business. Yes. So, I mean, exactly. like for me, oh, well. you know, I've I've always had a business rather than a business plan, you know. And, you know, and like I'm being a bit glib with that. Yeah, but, um, I think yeah. I think the business plan for to get the loan is more theoretical than than practical. Yeah. Yeah. It's most no, business it's, plans, I find. How much do you want to lie to you? Yeah. Well, you well. Know, if you are building your own business plan for yourself, then then yeah, you are more honest with yourself than than when you are building it for a bank and you want it to look good on the paper. So Very true. I, think, I think it's quite, it's, 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 uh, it's complicated and it's a waste of money. And of course, here in Japan, it's all done in very complicated Japanese language and, you know, uh, and a lot of charts and analytics and everything that they require. So you're, you're very right. We actually just did a business plan. Um, well, we opened the bank account for the new company, so we were asked to submit a business plan. And of course, we had our own business plan that we, you know, we made a reasonable, logical business plan projecting what we think we'll be making in the next few years. And when we showed that to our um, financial advisor, they're like, yeah, the bank will need much more than that. They want you to project stuff that's just, it's not even projectable. They want you to just like, dream up stuff that's probably yes. never going to be applicable yep. it's ridiculous yeah and we, we, did, it we did that for the bank we did that for the bank uh, right now as well because as you say even just opening a business account in japan is a little bit funny yeah. and they they ask a lot of numbers and things like that but yeah it's literally it's cooking out of now out of nothing so it's more of artificial thing but yeah everything's awesome. doable one thing i like about japan when it comes to no matter what you do whether it is getting personal private uh, loan or you want to do a business loan or whatever, if you are able to give them the documents that they have in their chart, if you are able to give it to them and they can do the click, 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 you yeah. get what you're asking for. Exactly. 
Exactly. That and sounds that like Australian good. immigration officials. I've had that experience with other government officials before. <laughs> you know, and it works to me. That works actually really well because, you know, if you can, they don't even often even look at the numbers as much as the fact that that paper has that name on it. Right. <laughs> yep. Yep. I look, it's exactly the same when you're getting a Minpaku license or a hotel license. Everything in Japan is exactly that. If you can yeah. check off the checklist for the, the, the civil servant behind the desk, then, then their job is done and they've got deniability. And it's like, well, no, they provided me with everything. It's, you know, I've done my due diligence. So, yeah. yeah I was going to say that's the definition of bureaucracy right there. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Emil, you were going to say something and we should finish up. So. Okay, so just I guess my the comment about the business loan, Blanca. I think you're you're definitely right. If you're trying to get a business loan to operate your business and to establish yeah. and start your business, yeah. yeah, you need the business plan. Um, I think the the issue, I, the type of loan I was talking about was someone starts a business and they just want to use that business to buy a property. Okay, that's different right. then. I was yeah, about, I was talking about like business operations uh, loan and and you know things like that. So. That was, I thought that's what yeah. you mean. I, that, yeah, yeah, no, so, so, so the issue, like, so that what we get clients are thinking, oh, like, what if, like, uh, you know, I get lots of clients that, look, I've already bought a home, I don't have any more borrowing capacity, or, you know, they just moved to Japan, and, like, I want to get a loan. And I said, well, you don't own a, you don't have any income here yet, or you've been employed at a company for only six months, um, and you're not a resident, so you can't really do it. I said, well, if I start a company, and then buy, get a business loan through the company and buy the property. Uh, well, you can't, like, for them to live, a house. Well, the bank won't really give you a business loan just to buy your personal home. That's yeah. not a business loan. It doesn't fall into that category um, unless your business is well established in buying real estate. Or maybe, you know, in, in Tracy's, um, for Tracy's business, because she does, you know, the short-term stays. Short-term rentals, yeah. <laughs> Friend. She yeah, she could. Uh, I think it's feasible for her to go to a bank and say, "This is what we do. I'd like to buy a building and set it up as a hotel." Then the yeah. bank is giving her okay. That's that's what her business does: short term yeah. rental, hotel management. It, it falls in that category. But someone just well, I'm going to set up a business and get a million dollar loan into it from a bank. Uh, <laughs> that yeah, that I, 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 the idea is nice. Japan, yeah. very funny. Yeah, and that's. I had a question. Yeah. I had a question from somebody last week. Like, okay, what if I buy um, a rundown hotel in Hokkaido or somewhere for five or eight million yen uh, and establish a business? What is that gonna give me? Like, <laughs> and I'm like headache. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think you you a headache. <laughs> you just lost your eight million. <laughs> yeah. eight I, million. I do. I, I must admit, though, I do like people like. And look, we've all done. I think because we're more experienced in it, we've had all of these thoughts, and we've thought about. And then when we actually go and have done it hands on, we learn. That, oh, what's practical? What's not? Exactly. What's practical? Right. Like yeah. and mm -hmm. yeah, and and. So, like, so from that point of view, we see right now. Oh yeah, no, no, that's that just looks like it's just going to be a headache. Don't, don't do it at all because we've got all that experience behind us. I remember early days in Japan. I'm like, hold on, because I'm Australian and interest rates are under one percent. That's ridiculous, and because Australia was five percent yeah. or eight percent at the time, um, and you get a hundred percent financing. Why aren't people just buying every house under the sun more and more and more and more? Here's why. And, yeah, Here's exactly. Why. And and you think that and and that's so that's a definitely legitimate question that a newbie or someone inexperienced. Will well, it ask works in other countries. That's why. Yes. Yeah. Well, and Matt would say the same thing about oh, getting the you know the the five hundred dollar houses. It's it's you know it's a, it's great clickbait, but then the practicalities and the uh, and the realities sort of uh, yeah. very different. Mm. But that's why we're here. We're the experts. That's on all why that we're sort of here. And, yes. Mm. Yeah, half so, the time, I think we exist to tell people what they cannot do. Right? <laughs> well, I mean, a hubris and chutzpah is, is great. And I think that sort of energy, you know, that sort of energy is a really, like, that's a really great place to start. Then 
educate and learn and then keep yeah. that energy because, you know, you're going to hit roadblocks and you're going to hit bureaucracy and you're going to hit like, you know, teeth sucking and people telling you you can't do it. So you've got to have that energy and that passion to start with to get you over those over those um, roadblocks, which will which will happen. So, yeah. um, I mean, I was told I, could, I shouldn't do short term rentals like, you know, it's like, yeah, but um, and well, uh, yeah, here I am so 10 years later, you know, yeah. So. Well, you know, yeah. Well, I get the opposite of a lot. So when people contact me or they, they start talking to me, it's about home loans. It's like personal home loans, right? And a lot of them actually start from a place where, oh, I'm not eligible for a loan yet because I don't have permanent residency. Um, or, oh, no, I'm a foreigner. I, I can't get a loan. They, they, they Or my, my friend was able to get a loan, but they're full-time employer. I'm a business owner, so I can't get a loan. They've already ruled themselves out. So yeah, they yeah. actually... I had often, thought that. Uh, that's is true. And yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I have to stop and tell them, actually, no, like you just said, you just already answered no to yourself without actually checking. Or you've done some research online and you've checked one or two banks that have said, oh, you don't have permanent residency. You can't get a loan or you need 20% deposit. But you don't really know the whole picture. You've just got a few bits of pieces of information, something you've heard from a friend here, something from there, and you've given yourself that, that impossible scenario that this can't happen, it can't work for me. Whereas really, hold on, someone like you know, like myself or any, any expert in your particular field knows, no, no, this is how someone in your situation can make it work. This is what you can get and what you can achieve. Um, and that's what I do with most of my phone calls. Uh, is you know sometimes people know you can't do it but sometimes they can uh, but yeah i actually find more of my clients or more people that inquire they bought they they think it's not doable they think it's not achievable um and i have to try to figure out how we can achieve it um the ones that come straight up and think that they can do all of this and we have to set them straight about what they cannot do i actually find at the end of the day the, the opposite is more true people are don't know the opportunities available. They've already think, ah, oh, it's not achievable for me. I can't invest. I can't do this. I can't, um, mm. you know, get a home. I can't renovate this. It's not, no, no, it's not going to happen. And we have to tell them about how the possibilities rather than, than the opposite. So, um, but then I think this is the, the wrong side of social media that it does this to people because people, instead of contacting an expert, for example, in this case, you, they go on social media, they ask a question and 30 people that have no idea what's going on start sharing their opinions, yeah. right? And, and loading them with all sorts of, you know, completely wrong information. Very few will say, okay, this and this person is somebody you should talk to. But most of them just overwhelm the people with mm -hmm. their own bad experience that is based on their own bad research. Not, you know, not even often a, a real experience going and being denied or they would not even admit often why they were denied and it might be completely different reason than they actually are saying. So the main to me, it's always uh, don't ask. Don't ask the social media. Ask, ask for a contact. Yeah. <laughs> ask, ask an expert. Ask for a contact, yeah. for, contact uh, for an expert. <laughs> Mm. Don't ask for Facebook expert groups, opinion. Uh, very entertaining. Yes. Yeah, no, and, it's hilarious. Yeah. It's hilarious. And that's why we're here. So, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, we'd love to get some up. questions. Yeah, we'd love to get some questions. So, hmm. All right. So All right. With Thank you so that, much. folks, uh, I will have to be off. My Me apologies. Too. And we will see you again very, very Me soon. Too. Maybe not in August, but otherwise. <laughs> see you okay. later. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. All right. As promised, nice long chat about all things money and finance related. As you've probably guessed by now, we're going to have Ben Tanaka come join us for a chat on all things retirement and financial management related very soon. So if you're not yet subscribed and getting your updates, either on our YouTube channel or the podcast, make sure you do subscribe so that you'll receive a notification when that episode drops. Now, before we go, we're also, as always, going to tell you and also link to our other sponsor's website. That's Hiroshi Shimizu, immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener. If you're thinking about moving here on a more permanent basis or you're already in Japan on some sort of a temporary visa, 
and you want to switch to a longer term or permanent one, or if you're considering setting up a local company or a branch office of a foreign company and you've got any sort of business or visa related inquiries, or even if you just want to find out what your options are on any of these topics, feel free to contact Hiroshi Shimizu. You can find him at japanimmigrationexperts.com and he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and extremely affordable consultation related to these topics. And he's already done that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him. Again, that's japanimmigrationexperts.com and you'll be well on your way. And that's it from us for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. Do share it with your networks and please let us know what you think. So leave us a short rating or review on the iTunes store, on Spotify, or just drop us a line in the comment section of wherever you might have found this episode. We love hearing from you. Hope to have you with us again next time. And until then, have a great day or night ahead. Yoroshiku! Yoroshiku!